But we're going to talk about, you know, liftgate diagnostics, preventive maintenance today. That's uh, some of you may be very familiar with our uh, systems. They've been around for, for many years, and some of the fleets have used uh, our different systems for, for many years and have gone through some of the several, you know, different variations. Uh, Columbus and Paul are going to talk about a lot of the diagnostics and kind of walkthroughs, you know, kind of a, it's a, a frequently asked questions almost of, you know, some of the most common things they get from uh, TechLine that if you all ever call into uh, Perky's tech support, Paul and Columbus are two of the people you're probably going to get most of the time. So um, we want to make sure they were involved with this and, and help share. Um, one of the biggest things we always want to talk about, though, is when we talk about any types of troubleshooting is uh, before you try to do troubleshooting on any of our systems is we want to make sure people are familiar with everything. One of the biggest parts of this uh, too is you're not going to be able to troubleshoot our systems with a test light. Um, I got a screen that keeps wanting to, to revert back, but uh, in order to properly troubleshoot our systems is you really need to be familiar with the multimeter. Um, and if you're not, uh, January, we did our Fundamentals of Multimeters class. Um, it is uh, provided for you in the resources link where there is a link to the uh, uh, recorded version of that webinar. There is also a link to a test that we provided for you. If you get an 80% or more on that test, it will generate a training certificate for you. Um, so it is a good refresher for the, the more experienced guys. And it's a good, you know, entry one for people that, you know, have not used a meter very much at all. So a uh, handy resource for you to go back and, and look at. Um, and we uh, start into the, the program today that on the screen right now, you'll see all of the uh, different systems that we have our direct and select, um, kind of our legacy products. Um, there are units even older than that. If you happen to come across those or anything that we don't cover today, don't ever hesitate to call our tech support and talk to Paul or Columbus or myself even. Um, we are here to help, and, you know, we do have systems that go back you know, close to 20 years. So if you run any of those and you need help, don't hesitate to call. But when we talk about all these systems, uh, one thing we kind of refer to as the nose box is the brain of the system. That is where the controller is that tells the converter, you know, what to do monitors the, the input voltage, you know, controls the lights, but that's really the brain. The DC to DC converter that we'll talk about in a little bit, or the P1020K plate, uh, that's the brawn of the system. So kind of kept in two separate systems, but regardless of which nose box you have, that part in the uh, battery box is almost always going to be the same. So uh, a lot of similarities between the systems. And as they go through them, and, you know, you'll see just how common a lot of stuff is. So once you understand the system, it's not hard to troubleshoot. But I'm going to turn it over to Columbus and let him start off on the uh, troubleshooting. All right. Thank you, Larry. And as he was saying, my name is Columbus, and I do handle a lot of the warranty and technical support here with Perkins. Um, so when you approach one of our trailers, you know, especially in the instances where it doesn't have any LEDs or the system itself is just not charging, Kind of throws up a little bit of red flags, you know, for everybody, especially the technician or whoever's, you know, just happens to be working on it. And um, so we're going to go into a little bit of, about what we can check when going through this system to help try to diagnose, you know, some some possible issues that we might run across. So starting off in the liftgate battery box, you're going to notice that inside there should be a mounted 30 amp circuit breaker. It should just be on a little aluminum L bracket that is mounted somewhere typically on the left or right hand side of the box or even the top. Um, now with this circuit breaker itself, we did design it to where it was kind of facing the opening of the box so that way if it was to ever have been tripped, it's going to be easy, easily visible. And you can kind of notice in the picture on your right uh, of the screen where you know, you, you have your writing there, but there's also a little yellow tang that if the breaker was to ever trip, it's going to flip that out. And then uh, all it usually takes is just pushing it back in to go ahead and reset it. And um, another thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that it's mounted correctly. Uh, the reason why I say this is because these trailers are up and down the road for hundreds of thousands of miles. And of course, you know, they're not running across just the smoothest of all roads. 
just because nowhere's perfect. But uh, so uh, as you could imagine, if it wasn't mounted securely, it's just going to be bouncing all over the place, causing all kinds of racket. Um, and in turn, you know, it leads us to our next part there is always inspect your wire connections that's on the back side of the breaker. Because with if without it being mounted correctly, you know, it, those terminals themselves, they're they're not, you know, made of stone. So they're going to they're going to weaken and get brittle over time if they if they don't if they're not fixated you know, to where they're not moving around a whole lot. So you want to make sure that all your, your wiring and connections are nice and tight. And um, moving on to the next here, and this is just kind of continuing along in the pattern that we're going as far as checking for no LEDs or inevitably just no charge to the liftgate batteries. Um, and that is, you'll find on the DC to DC converter plate or the P1020K plate assembly, is a red junction stud that has a couple different wires on there one of them being that circuit breaker wire but also a little black fuse holder that is going to bridge between that positive output stud there as you can see in the picture on the right um, and you can kind of faintly see that it, it connects up to an orange wire there and that's going to be our liftgate battery sense wire now with our dc to dc converter Though it does charge the batteries, it also functions as a giant diode. So it's not able to let power flow back through it. So with that fuse there, it allows us to still get a little bit of voltage to power those LEDs on the front of that controller on the front of the trailer. Um, so if you ever notice that that fuse is blown, chances are it could be part of the cause of you not having any LEDs on the front and part of the reason why your liftgate batteries are not getting the charge that they need. So by replacing that, you're ensuring that it's going to be, you know, operating sufficiently as far as in the battery box, and then we can continue on with our troubleshooting steps. You'll have to apologize. We are having problems advancing the slides properly, so hopefully we're staying up on the right one. All right, but anyways, continuing on. Um, so if you do have your meter handy, which I highly recommend, especially if you end up calling in just because uh, though we would love to see, you know, firsthand what all you guys are experiencing, sadly, you know, eyes just don't reach through the phone like they used to. Um, but um, if you were to take your multimeter and put your positive lead there on that orange wire that we just spoke about, and then take your negative lead and put it on that ground stud that's there at the bottom of of the page there on that picture uh, what this is going to do is going to give you a, a reading of what should be the liftgate battery voltage now if you are seeing that voltage then that ensures yourself that there's no trip in your breaker and your fuse is obviously good because it's allowing that voltage to come through um, so you shouldn't should never see um, any kind of voltage that's that's dropping below what your liftgate batteries are and if you do and it's not exactly what your liftgate batteries are, are setting at then you might want to start trying to inspect some of your wiring just to make sure that everything is properly crimped and there's no breaks or cuts or pinches or anything just because inevitably if you're running into that you know it's it's something to definitely get fixed before moving on to the next steps And now this leads us to our first poll question that we've got, um, and it states, how many amps should the small mini fuse be rated at? Now on your screen, you're gonna notice that each one of these selections here has a circle on there. So I would uh, like you to go ahead and, and choose what, what answer that you think that it's going to be. We have some that are at 30 amps, five amps, two amps, and 15 amps. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to go ahead and select your answers and hit submit there at the bottom right-hand corner. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, from the looks of it, you know, two amps is going to be what it is rated at. Now, that being said, I know that some te technicians find themselves, you know, in the field and they're working on these trailers and they run into these scenarios like this. And, you know, sometimes having a, a two amp fuse is, is comes far and few between. Uh, five amps, 
are about the max that I would ever recommend, you know, replacing anything, but that would probably be more along the lines of a short term, uh, just until you can get a two amp to replace it, just because when we go through about replacing parts on our systems, we want to make sure that they are fit to the T and what they respect for. And now I am going to go ahead and I am going to turn this over to Paul and let him give you a little bit of insight on some further diagnostics. Hey everybody. Yeah. Seeing that Columbus has covered the battery box on the uh, issue of not having any LEDs on the controllers. We're gonna go up to the front now if we didn't find any issues in the battery box. And this is what we're gonna do on the front of the trailer with the controller. We're gonna open that controller up and we're gonna take our multimeter and we're gonna put our leads right where it's showing on the screen. We're gonna put our negative lead on the negative white wire that goes back to the battery box and our positive lead to the orange wire post. Now in this uh, slide here, it shows the select system and uh, you can take that 12 pin module out to have easier access to the orange uh, wire pin. But I suggest when you do that, while you're right there with it in your hands, visually inspect that 12 pin module. Look at the plug inside the box, as well as the pins in the module itself. Make sure everything is clean. There's no debris in there and the pins are good and straight. And then once you test it and you have uh, at least six volts or higher, then we'll go on to the next one and you can put your 12 pin module back in. We're gonna look at the, the different style controllers that we have, and we'll show you where the leads need to be on each controller. This is our newer select and direct system, and there's your leads that shows that the positive and the negative were on the negative wire and the orange wire. This here is our direct flex plus system and if you look at the leads you'll see the positive is on the orange wire but the negative the ground lead is on the opposite side of that fuse the fuse if you look at the white wire that's going into our four conductor is on the opposite side of that fuse that's where you want your lead to be the reason being is that fuse could possibly be blown and then you wouldn't get a proper reading and the reason why we have a fuse on the ground side is it protects that four conductor of any issues uh, Larry had an issue in the past where there was a bad ground in the pump box and it melted and burned up our four conductor from the charging system. So that's why we have that fuse in there to protect our system of any issues that might come about. So you want to make sure that your leads are in the proper positions to get the proper voltage readings if there is any. And always make sure that you have more than six volts. Okay, once you've got all that, then you want to check the system out. You go ahead and get the tractor started. You plug in your dual pole or your seven way. Properly. But if you're not getting solid green lights and you're getting a flashing light scenario, you, there is a reference guide that you can refer to that is in uh, this, six, this session. Also, uh, if you have any rapid flashing light on one side or the other, say you have a solid green light on the LED or lift battery, and you have a flashing light, orange light on the sub source, that could possibly mean a positive fuse blown inside a controller. That works as well as the opposite side. If you have a solid green light on your source and a rapid flashing light on your lift battery, it could mean that you have a, a negative fuse blown in the controller. And you'll want to check both of those out with that type of a scenario. Leads to test on those uh, on the uh, ignition wire to check, make sure, see why the system's not charging. We want to take our leads and put them on the black and the ground first. That is showing us that we're actually having an output voltage going back to the charging plate in the battery box. We want to make sure we have good voltage there and check all wiring and make sure everything is solid and tight and all connections are tight. And there it shows on the note on the bottom about the rapid flashing orange where it indicates, but there is also, as I say, reference uh, references of the cheat sheets that we call them and the logic guides uh, in 
in this session here at the end there. And just want to announce that we did a, a quick reset on our end, so hopefully we are all matching on our slides now. So I do apologize for that. Okay. We just covered that one about the cheats in that one. Okay, here's another, uh, some more of our systems where it shows where the leads need to be. Uh, and again, you wanna make sure that the leads are on the proper pins to check the voltages on the black input wire and the white ground wire. This is the voltage that is coming from the tractor, but it's actually going back to the battery box to the charging plate to uh, make the system run properly. Okay, here we want to check and see if it's uh, still, if it's not having a charging issue. And we want to check the yellow wire. The yellow wire is the ignition wire. That's the wire that sends voltage back to the converter to turn it on. Uh, what we want to see is at least 10 to 13 volts there. Uh, if you're getting 10 to 13 volts, as it says, we can go to the next step. But if you're not getting uh, any voltage coming out of that yellow wire, but you're getting good voltage out of your black and your white wire, and you want to call the tech system because we may need to look deeper into it, which means take a little more time than what this uh, webinar will cover. But uh, if not, then we can also take care of uh, a possible replacement for you. There's a couple more of our systems, our new ones that uh, shows exactly where to be testing. And again, it's the negative wire that uh, is uh, attached to the battery box and then the positive lead goes to the yellow wire. And it goes back to the, the charging plate, which turns the converter on. And again, you wanna see 10 to 13 volts on that wire. All righty, we're gonna turn it back over to Columbus, but one thing I did wanna just kind of wrap up what Paul was saying, and again, the, the commonality of all these systems. That four conductor main harness that goes from the nose box back to the, the plate assembly, again, they're all the same. White is gonna be ground, going to send ground back to the plate system. Black is power for your actual you know, charging line. Orange is a power line going from the liftgate batteries up to the nose box. And as Paul just said, the yellow wire is ignition. That's what turns that converter off and on. Because one of those things that we always try to do with any of our systems is we wanna fix liftgate charging issues and give you the best performance we can. But one thing we don't ever wanna do is have a truck no start, you know, trying to charge liftgate batteries. So. There's a lot of logic in that nose box to you know, charge those batteries all we can, but not cause another problem. So uh, again, no matter which system you're working on, those four wires are all the same. And back to Columbus. Oh, I appreciate that, Larry. And um, so picking up what we left off back here in the battery box, um, mind you, you still have your voltmeter handy because uh, that'll never leave your side when, when you're coming down and trying to do some troubleshooting on one of our systems. Okay. so. Now, if you flip it over to DC volts there, and what we're gonna start out with is we're gonna start out with disconnecting that four pin harness going into the converter. Essentially, what we wanna see happen here is we wanna go ahead and we wanna have our tractor connected. We wanna be able to make sure that we're able to read the voltage that is coming out of it. Um, and then, of course, feeding all the way back. This is assuming that everything is going to be looking A-OK -okay up front. And uh, now we just need to verify that everything is gonna be making it making it to its final destination where it needs to be going. Okay, so with your meter, what I would strongly recommend starting out with is checking that input voltage. Check, uh, check what we got coming from the truck. Now, depending on the trailer length, truck length, you know, if you're running a straight truck, if you're running a dry van, a uh, refrigerated trailer, uh, regardless of what the case may be, you're gonna have to account for a little bit of voltage drop. Now, anything more than a half a volt is kind of concerning especially to us just because, you know, we don't hardly see that much. Um, and with testing all these voltages with the four pin harness disconnected from the converter, what we're able to do is, is test the, the voltage that we're, that should be around about what we're getting from our tractor um, or the reefer in this case as well for those refrigerated trailers. Now, uh, what we'll wanna do is we'll start out with using our positive lead and you'll find pin number one, which is going to be a black wire. Um, this is gonna be your main power input wire, and it's gonna be the one that's gonna be su supplying the voltage from the tractor for the duration of the trailer and back to the converter. Uh, so we'll start off with our positive lead there, and then we'll also find on uh, pin number, let's see, pin number three, I believe, is going to be your white wire, and of course, that's where you'll, you'll uh, hook up your, your negative lead to. 
This right here is going to give you around about the same voltage of what your tractor's putting out. Uh, and mind you, you know, this is without a load. So, of course, you know, once you go to plug in to the converter and the converter actually gets engaged with the, the whole operation, you're going to see that voltage drop because then a load is being put on there. Um, but essentially, at this very moment, what we're trying to do is verify that we are getting the, the right voltages that we need. And as long as you're reading what your truck is putting out or around about that same voltage, then we can go ahead and move on to the next step. And again, you know, this, this is another one that's kind of reverting back to, you know, what Paul was stating before in regards to the ignition wire. Now, this right here is just going to be the whole keys to the operation because without ignition power, it's just like your truck. It's just not going to start. Um, so... Again, you know, we want to see around 10 to 13 volts on there. That's usually my happy range. You know, that says, okay, well, we're at least getting enough uh, enough voltage from from the tractor in order to get get this up and going. With our newer systems, it it's a it's a little bit easier to, to achieve some of some of or versus some of our older ones. Um, but essentially, it all works the same um, as both Larry and Paul stated before. And um, so we want to see that 10 to 13 volts on there so that we can get the converter to turn on. And then from there, that's that's pretty much where the magic's going to happen, um, and that's where it's going to start getting that converter to start pumping out the amperage to those batteries. And as long as we're seeing that, then we can go ahead and move on to the next. All right. And now this right here is more focused around what's going to be happening on on the receiving end uh, or the output end of the whole thing, and with Again, mind you, we've got the four pin disconnected. So at this point, all you're really going to be able to read is the liftgate battery voltage coming off of that red output cable. And you'll find that located on uh, pin number two, as well as, you know, using the same white wire on pin three. Um, <clears throat> so you want to see what your liftgate batteries are sitting at on this wire, because again, mind you, You've got your 30 amp circuit breaker, which is going to be attached to the positive on, on your liftgate batteries themselves. And then you're going to be moving that back over to that positive output stud, which is then going to feed that little red wire that you're reading this voltage. And then once you plug that four pin harness back into the converter and the converter powers up and it's doing its thing, then uh, you're going to see that voltage that it's going to be stepping it up to. Uh, I've always referred to that converter in the battery box as more or less the alternator for the battery box. Uh, just because it's going to see that voltage just like your truck does. It's going to try to step it up to try to counterbalance any kind of loads that are going to be put on there, such as the lift gate um, or if you're running interior lights or anything like that. Uh, now, if you're not seeing any voltage on this, again, revert back to that 30 amp circuit breaker. You know, we, we want to make sure that everything is going to be working properly uh, before we plug this back in. Just because if we don't, then all that work that we've just previously gone through is just going to be retraced and, and have to go over again. Okay. Thank you very much, Columbus. Paul's going to do our next poll question. All right, guys. What is the minimum voltage for the liftgate batteries must be in in order for the system to power up? If you read that again, what is the minimum voltage that the liftgate batteries need for our system to power up? I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer that question. Just click on the circle and hit submit. A couple more seconds and... Like most people got it right. Yeah. Six volts is the minimum. Excellent. And if you notice, we did use values that are on different, you know, parts of this system. That's why it's so important whenever you are trying to troubleshoot it and especially call tech support um, to have a multimeter. That's, you know, our system has, you know, different thresholds either for off or on um, that that logic dictates. And if we don't know exactly what the voltage is, it makes it very hard to help troubleshoot it. So, um, but those are uh, uh, all numbers that are used in the system for different things. But yes, yeah, six volt is the minimum that's required of the liftgate batteries for our system to power up and, and work. Yeah, and I, I just want to add one thing with what Larry said about the meter 
instead of a light tester is because of those different various uh, voltages. One tenth or two tenths of a volt could mean the difference of that system working properly or not working properly. So when we're doing a diagnostic and troubleshoot, we need to know exactly what voltages readings there are from point to point. Yeah, and good is not a good answer. Right. Yes, you know, doing a tech call and so well, what's the voltage here? It's good. And it's like, well, that doesn't tell me anything. That's, you know, it's like Paul was saying, that's, you know, uh, for one of the, the situations or scenarios, the voltage has to be at least 13.2 volts. If you're at 13.15, you can be there all day long. It's not going to do anything because it's not high enough for it to start that sequence. So it's all very important that um, you do have a meter when you're trying to troubleshoot these. Next thing we're, I'm going to take over again, we're going to talk about preventive maintenance. Um, all the pictures we're going to show you are uh, real world scenarios, things we've seen. Um, and people always want to know, you know, what should we do or what can I do or where do I start, you know, on some of these things. And the, the key to a lot of this is just good preventive maintenance, taking a look at uh, what you see on these trailers. Um, usually when someone has a liftgate failure or a, uh, a road call for a liftgate, um, you've had a problem for several days, or maybe even longer than that, but at least several days that the system has not been working and you've just finally ran out of battery power. Um, and I've talked to several fleets and said, well, should we do this? Should we do that? So I would rather you spent the, that five minutes just taking a good look at systems and making sure things are right. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we all face is road service. Um, if a unit's on the side of the road, the most important you know, goal is to get the thing running. Um, there's things that we can do on the side of the road that we'd never do in a shop, but when they do happen, we need to make sure we fix them properly when they do get back to a shop. So we're just gonna kind of walk through the system. You know, this one we're showing a, a direct box. Um, when we say direct box, this is one that has one input source. Um, but take a look, is it mounted securely? Has the driver used it as a step for some reason? Um, has it been backed into? Um, you know, cord didn't get unplugged and, you know, uh, shot back and, and damaged it. Um, you know, any of those things that's, yes, it may be working now, but if it's got a crack in it, it's filling up with water, it's going to fail on you, fix it now. Um, main harnesses, whether it comes out of a direct box, select box, any of them, is take a look at them. You know, this one you can see has been wrapped with electrical tape. I guarantee you that wasn't part of our harness when we shipped it out of here. Something like that's usually a, a, a harness that was uh, routed very low, uh, driver backed into it with a, a fifth wheel and caught it, cut it in half. Someone probably put five butt connectors in there and wrapped with electrical tape. Yes, it's working, but how long is it going to be before corrosion gets in there and causes you a problem um, and causes you a road call? So, yeah, uh, electrical tape, butt connectors, all those things are very good indicators of, of previous work and then damage that's in there. And following that harness all the way back. Um, and yes, it's hard to see it, you know, through the channels underneath the trailer, but, um, you know, take a look. Is it hanging down anywhere? Um, I saw one time that under the, the fifth wheel plate, it had been allowed to hang down and drive her back underneath the trailer, cut the four-way harness, you know, completely in two. Uh, for some reason, our system didn't work. Uh, so uh, take a look at it. This is one where it actually goes back into the battery box. You can see all the butt connectors, that fuse holder is not in there. Uh, I'm not even sure what this harness is at this point. Um, but yeah, you're looking for, for all kinds of failures to happen. Again, the, the nylon butt connectors, whatever, they're great for the side of the road, but you can't leave them there for uh, a permanent repair. Now, looking at the plate assembly, is it securely mounted? Um, there's four quarter inch bolts that go through the, the wall of the battery box, should have uh, flat washers, lock washers, and nuts on it. Um, we sent all that out stainless, so hopefully it doesn't rust and corrode on you, but make sure it's tight. Um, that's a lot of metal, a lot of potential that if it did come loose to fall across batteries, um, you could have a, a, a large mess very quickly. So you want to take a look at that. Um, the four stud connections, and actually in this picture, there's a lot of stuff wrong with it. Um, that uh, you have two quote unquote input uh, wires. Those are both eight gauge wires. They have three eighths eyelets on them. They go to the red stud and the black stud. You have that uh, yellow wire that Paul was talking about before, which is your ignition. You'll notice it's labeled on the plate. And right above that yellow wire is where the orange wire is supposed to go. You notice it's missing here. Someone, for some reason, decided to uh, take it off of that terminal strip. They put a 3 8 eyelet on it, put it straight to the liftgate batteries. Does it work? Hmm, yes, but 
one, it's not right, so it's going to be more difficult for someone else to troubleshoot it. But the other thing, too, is now they've taken that uh, two-amp fuse out of the circuit, so it's not protected. Um, so, you know, lots of issues here. You notice, too, the fuse holder is missing a fuse. The cover's not on it. And guys that are very familiar, uh, you'll notice that there's also a ground wire missing from the, the ground stud there. So uh, lots of different things are wrong with this uh, picture here. Um, the other thing is, uh, just is it tight? Uh, I'm a firm believer if I'm going to you know, do an inspection or an audit at a fleet is I bring a, a 9 16 socket, long extension and ratchet, same thing with a 3 8 for those two small ones, and just reach in there and just make sure they're snug all the time. Um, also kind of wiggle the wires around. I've uh, seen several times where, you know, poor crimps, um, the, uh, the wire's actually making and breaking contact inside there. And we send it all out with, you know, good terminals and heat shrink. Uh, installers don't always use the right stuff. Um, seen some very poor crimps. Uh, if you do see the uh, generic nylon or plastic connectors used, my humble opinion, I would cut them off now, replace them correctly. Uh, again, you're just asking for a future failure. Oops, we got a duplicate here. Hmm. We got another duplicate. Um, apologize for that. Uh, somehow it double populated those slides. But um, next, we're going to talk about that four conductor harness. And I saw we had a question uh, pop in about this harness. Um, is that four-way Deutsch connector. In the back of a battery box, it can be hard to make sure it's all the way properly seated. Um, uh, it's one of those things that it has to be all the way in. Um, you might have to take a pair of pliers if you don't have a real good you know, hand strength. Make sure it is all the way in. That is a very important connection, and if it doesn't get a good connection, it is a source of failures. Um, but uh, just like you know, connections or repairs anywhere, is if someone's you know worked on this harness, which one I don't know why it's a fairly uh, inexpensive and easy to repair harness, so I would never you know quote unquote repair it. I just replace it. Um, but I've seen where they don't get seated in all the way, um, and uh, I just tell you to make sure it's plugged in. Now I'm gonna tell you to unplug it. Uh, <laughs> is one thing about this system is if you look at the entire system, the place with the lowest potential voltage and the highest potential current is that uh, black wire where it goes into this uh, connector, that is the input power. Um, but that is gonna be the place you're gonna have the, the highest likelihood of a failure. Um, the other thing too is uh, seeing where they don't get plugged in all the way. The terminal doesn't get uh, locked into the connector properly. Uh, also see people using dielectric grease. Deutsch does not recommend any type of grease sealants, anything on their connectors. Uh, same thing in that I missed it before when we were talking about the 12 pin module on the selects, um, is we don't want you to use anything in any of those connectors. Um, one, they can cause a hydraulic effect or it can kind of push them back out. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, they can be an insulator. So we try to use all the right crimps and all the right processes but that should be a sealed connector and shouldn't have a failure. If it does though, that harness can be and should be replaced. And the other thing too is when you do have this apart, we want to make sure we look at the uh, mating connector on the DC to DC converter. Because if it has been heated up, a lot of times they'll kind of have a uh, almost a black scaling on them or a black coating uh, from the heat. Make sure you reach in there with something and clean them. There is some special little brushes and cleaning tools out there on the market. Um, even as a small piece of emery cloth, something you want to get all that, uh, the black oxidation, if you will, off that terminal to make sure you're getting a good clean connection again. If you don't, and even though you replace that short harness, you can very easily have a repeat failure because again, it still did not get a good connection. And I will add something real quick here. Uh, and this is coming from a warranty standpoint. so. A lot of times when, when issues like this do occur, uh, first instinct is, oh, okay, well, obviously something's happened with the converter. And, um, you know, as Larry was saying, you know, and this is just tagging on to, to what, he, what he had stated, was, um, you know, when you go in there to clean these, if you can make sure that that, that that pin is cleaned off, I mean, I'm 
I'm talking, you know, you're not going to be able to shine it up like brand new, but more or less just cleaning all the debris around the base of it, uh, cleaning off the pin itself and, and making a good solid connection for when you do go back to put in that new harness. It will save you, you know, shipping costs if you were to go through with warranty and have it, have the converter itself shipped back to us because nine and a half out of 10 times when we receive one of these converters in for warranty uh, with a suspected failure, chances are there's nothing wrong with it. Um, from my knowledge, these things are absolutely bulletproof. Uh, I've seen the fins broke. I've seen them banged and busted and looked like they just got thrown into a river for a couple years. And, um, you know, plug them in and they work just fine. And then me, I, I like to try, to try to help as much as I can um, but I would hate to have to have somebody, you know, pay for shipping back to you if, if it was found to not be defective. So just keep that in mind. And if you'd like us like further assistance on it, as far as the cleaning and stuff, please feel free to reach out to us. You know, we, we, we've been around these, we've seen them in the field and, you know, and we've got, got little tips and tricks that might help you out. Yeah, and some of the, the fleets that are on this uh, webinar today, because we can you know see who all signed up, some of you have bought one of our tools called a liftgate double check. That is a, uh, a test fixture that allows you to not only power up the trailer, but you can also you know troubleshoot the converter. There's lots of things it can do. Um, but yeah, as, as Columbus was saying, is the converter itself has less than a 1% failure rate. Um, so we always get real, uh, questioning if someone wants to buy a, a new you know controller and a converter and it's like no at this point someone's probably just throwing parts at um you're never going to lose both of those at the same time and the the odds of a converter failing are pretty slim it's usually something else that was misdiagnosed um that you know looks like a bad converter when in fact it's not so don't ever hesitate to call in uh, again look at the resource guide for the uh, all of us that are on the uh, email today or the presentation today um, a lot of you know me uh, from emails or whatever. Don't hesitate to reach out. We are here to help. Um, we will walk you through it. The other thing, too, is um, we stand behind our product. If it is a Perky's product, it has a three-year warranty on it. So don't just order a part. Go through text. It's a warrantable, eligible uh, return. Um, give them the serial number. They can tell you how old it was, and they'll issue an RMA so you can set it in for warranty submission. Um, again, we do stand behind it. So. Um, don't ever hesitate to call us. Um, this kind of goes back to our uh, one of our questions earlier is, you know, take a look at this two amp fuse. Um, and, you know, is it a two amp fuse? You know, somebody replaced it with a three, four, five, thirty. Um, that, that is only a, a 16 gauge wire. And if you replace it with too high of a fuse, um, you can have a major thermal event. Um, because that fuse couldn't uh, protect the wire like it's supposed to. The other thing too is make sure you put the cover back on. I see tons of these where no one ever flips that cover back on, they wind up corrosion in them. Mm -hmm. Talked about the 30 amp breaker before. Um, you know, it, it is mounted there for you know a reason to make it easy to see, um, easy to troubleshoot. Um, you know, even though you can't see the back, at least put your hand on the back, make sure everything's tight. Um, you know, nothing's been damaged. Uh, make sure it is there. Uh, previous versions, we used to use the fuse cube to protect the fuses or to protect the, the charging system. So if yours is an older system, it may not have the 30 amp circuit breaker. It may have a fuse. Um, you can upgrade it to this if you'd like. Um, but no matter what, we have to have that fuse protection. We want to make sure the system's, you know, protected not only at the front, but at the rear as well. We're going to go into the bracket a little bit more here in a second, but um, somehow I skipped over our poll question. Let me get to it. Okay. Um, question for you, should the positive and negative wires from the Perky system be on opposite batteries in the battery box? Let me give you a couple uh, seconds there to, to answer that. Again, just click one of the circles and hit submit. Give you a couple minutes before we go to the results, then we'll explain the, the answer to that question. I would hum a little bit, but that'll just annoy everybody. All right, so the results yes, looks like uh, two thirds of people got it right. 
And the reason behind that is not it's going to you know uh, work or not work, but the whole idea of any time you're either putting energy into a battery or pulling energy out of a battery, um, and that's really a battery pack, you want to put that energy in across that whole pack as much as possible, and you want to pull it out as much as possible. And there's a, a picture we'll show you in a minute. So if you have two batteries in a battery box, you know, positive should be on one battery, negative should be on the opposite battery. Uh, same thing for a load. You know, in this case, we're talking about lift gates. The power for lift gate should come off one battery and ground should come off the other. What we're trying to do is make sure we're pulling that energy out of both batteries as evenly as possible and also putting it back in as much as possible. Uh, is it, again, going to be a, a instant death either way? No. All we're trying to do is get you the, the best performance out of the, the product and the best life out of the batteries as possible. Um, this one is again one of those pictures that's got lots of things wrong with it. Um, but this is again real world experience where you know, uh, out uh, doing some audits and surveys for some fleets, and these are the kind of things we, we run across. And someone wonders why they have issues. Um, but if you notice, that 30 amp uh, breaker bracket is not mounted to anything, it's just flopped around on top of the batteries. There is not a battery hold down in there at all. Um, if you notice, too, there's two totally different batteries in there. I think they're they're both the same manufacturer, but different models, um, which I'm sure they're also different ages. Um, our recommendation is batteries should be within uh, six months of each other. If you don't replace them as a pack, um, try to always be the same manufacturer within 50 CCAs of each other. Just try to keep them as much of a match set as possible. Um, the other thing you can see is the black uh, liftgate ground cable coming in there. Someone replaced it didn't do a real good crimp on it, didn't use any heat shrink. So just lots of things that's going to cause you know, this fleet a problem down the road if they don't address them now. The thing is that we, we never have time to fix it right, but we have time to fix it four times. Um, the other thing, too, is just put a quick wrench on batteries. Uh, this one didn't need a wrench to find out it was loose, but um, obviously you're, you're only working off one battery in that uh, battery box. And probably not even that very well because the uh, main cables wasn't even tight. So you're, you're probably not charging those batteries very well, and you're not getting all the energy back out of them very well either. One thing we talk about battery connections, um, there's a lot of uh, different rules of thumbs people use out there for um, anti-corrosion sprays. Um, some people buy you know the grease, some people buy the lift all spray, some people just use spray paint. I don't care what you use, the whole idea you're trying to uh, protect the bare metal, but clean it, you know, top, bottom, the lead pad of the battery, clean everything, put it together, tighten it, and then apply it. Um, anything that you put on beforehand, I've been in fleets before where they put a big blob of grease on the battery stud, then put cables on. Grease is an insulator. You might as well put plastic washers on there. So, um, you know, bright and tight is what one of my good friends always said and then apply whatever you're going to. You just want to keep that, that bare metal protected. And that's usually one of the biggest problems we have is people don't open battery boxes like they, they used to when they run our systems because they don't have all the failures like they had before. Um, so out of sight, out of mind, then you look in the battery box, you can tell nobody's touched it in a very long time. Um, corrosion is not a very good conductor. I just want to add one thing quick, Larry, is, uh... I had a tech call the other day that had this exact same scenario and the system, the LEDs were doing weird things on the front on our controller. And once he cleaned that up and changed the connection on the cable and hooked everything back up, our system worked perfectly. He was getting a voltage drop issue and bad connection because of all the corrosion in the battery box. This is kind of an example of what we you know talked about before with those connections. We got the yellow arrows. Just saying, you know, opposite uh, batteries. Uh, same thing applies if you have three batteries, you're just going to move, you know, to the, the next outside battery or four batteries. You're trying to get across that battery bank as much as possible. Again, one here is uh, mismatched batteries. Um, hold downs. You know, I was at a fleet not too long ago and I, I couldn't find the picture, but the hold down bar was left laying across the batteries with none of the studs in place 
in the hold down bar had actually moved around enough that it was actually shorting between uh, the two different batteries. So hold downs are very important. The other thing too is anyone in batteries will tell you vibration is a killer of batteries. Uh, you need them to be held down securely, um, but not so securely that you start making batteries into use. Um, if you start deforming the top of a battery, you've uh, way over tightened it and you can damage that battery. Um, if nothing else, you can crush it to the point that the vents don't work. So be very careful. Um, now, uh, there are torque values for all this stuff. I'm probably never gonna tell somebody you're gonna torque a battery nut, but you know, 10 to 15 pounds isn't very much. Um, so don't ever use power tools because you can damage the batteries. Um, if you look at a group 31, that uh, stainless steel stud in the battery, all it is is a bolt that's cast into the lead when the battery's made. So if you use impact tools or anything, you can, uh, hit it with enough torque that you're gonna uh, break that stud loose and you're gonna have a high resistance connection going forward. So uh, be very careful when you do that. You know, we'll take a look at the batteries. Um, you know, have they been loose before? Um, I opened up a battery box oh, a couple months ago and uh, one of the batteries was damaged when the trailer was built. Nobody ever swapped it. It was you know, eating up the, the plate that the batteries were sitting on. Plus, if the battery's losing that much electrolyte, it's going to fail. You're going to have problems. Uh, plus, we don't need any more corrosion in the battery box than we already get. Um, another one, too, is the battery box or the battery hold down is loose enough. The batteries had actually slid up against the door and sitting there moving just enough that it was actually wearing a hole in the side of a battery. Okay, another question for you. How often should all the connections be checked in the battery box? First one is once a year. Second one is anytime road service has been done. Third one is a driver write up for lift gate issues. Or last one, all of the above. I'll let you think about all those for a second, and we'll advance to the results. All righty, all the above is 100% correct. Um, twice a year minimum, if nothing else has been done, I highly recommend you do a load test on the batteries, you clean everything, give it a good thorough going over. Um, if the road service has been done, again, road service people are not gonna have the same policies and procedures as the fleet does. So if you have had a trailer that's been worked on by somebody else, the next time it's in your shop, take a look at it. What did they do? Um, did they add 37 butt connectors to it? Um, I can tell you horror stories of things we've we've heard. I had one the other day where um, someone had you know stolen a lot of the, the harnesses out of a trailer, um, and someone rewired it. Uh, did they rewire it correctly? Maybe, maybe not. So you want to take a look at it. And if a driver has a write up for a liftgate issue, you definitely want to take a look at it. Um, we had a, an example: uh, Jimmy Fielding, one of our other uh, service application engineers. Um, he couldn't be here today, he was on the road uh, uh, helping work with customers, but had a customer that swore our system wasn't working right. Uh, driver complained that, you know, uh, it would get slow during the day. Long story short, the whole problem was simply batteries were old. They were over six years old and they had just totally lost capacity. But quote unquote, everything seemed to work and as long as he had a fresh charge on, there's enough there. But if he had to do more than a couple of cycles at a stop, there's just no capacity in those batteries. So. Um, you know, drivers can be very good at, you know, letting us know when we start having issues. Um, batteries age from the day you put them in, they have less and less capacity every day. So, um, as they do age, you're going to have less, you know, energy there from the use. All righty. Uh, question and answer time. Um, we had a few come in. I think we've answered a lot of them, but we will take a look and see what has come in. Um, we do have one, uh, Columbus, you want to take that one? It seems to be, um, uh, it was keyed in when we we're talking about the four way, uh, connector on the DC to DC converters. You know, could this cause it to melt? Yes. And that is the answer to that question. So when it comes down to that black wire, that's, that's being referred to in that harness, uh, which is when these when these harnesses do, you know, 
start to fail or start to burn up. Uh, that is usually the, usually the cause is the black wire because it is your main current bearing wire that's in, and that is the final checkpoint before it hits that converter. Um, so knowing all of that, you know, it, it could be, could have been a, a loose connection. Like Larry was saying, you need to make sure that all of these are are connected properly. You know, they, they it, it's hard to hear it sometimes, but sometimes you can you can listen, you can hear an audible click when when it locks into place. Uh, but going back to the plug, though, um, bad crimps, you know, bad crimps, damaged wires, loose connections, all of this stuff causes high resistance. And with that resistance comes a lot of heat. And that's where you'll start seeing things start start to bubble up, start to discolor, start to melt. And essentially, you know, it kind of leaves you with the scenario that, that you saw in the picture there. You know, just a, just a black hole where wires should be um, but again you know if you if you follow through with with the preventative maintenance and just the general checkups on your battery box like Larry was explaining you know that that right there is going to help you out a lot you know when it comes down to, to doing your PMs on, on your battery box disconnect that that plug give each wire a nice little little tug and, and make sure that uh, everything is locked into place inspect your wiring you know this this is this is y'all's money maker you know right here you know you you gotta you gotta have your lift gates to, to make these make these trips. So you know if you take care of it, it will take care of you. Um, someone else asked a question about the uh, tester we talked about before from the the lift gate double check. Um, it is not on here. Um, we'd be more than happy to send you some information. We try not to be too sales oriented on these, um, but if you do have question or if you have uh, an interest, uh, please put it in the the chat or whatever. Uh, and we'll be more than happy to follow up with you uh, after this too and email you some information. We have your emails from, from the sign up. So if there's anything that you you know don't want to answer or put out here for us to, to answer right now, um, please feel free to, to leave a note and we'll follow it up and send you some information. Um, one thing about that, that tester tool is we make the kit in a bunch of different ways under different part numbers depending upon what a fleet needs. So um, it's, it's not a uh, a cut and dry one to, to answer. Um, yeah, it's not a one size fits all. No, that we, you know, with, with tools, we don't want to uh, send you a bunch of parts that, for example, if you only use seven way charging for, for your lift gate fleet, we don't want to send you all the, the dual pole fixtures and everything else or vice versa. So, um, uh, but again, leave a note, we'll be more than happy to follow up with you or, or reach out to us. Um, someone asked, would we recommend dielectric grease on connections? Depends on the connections. Um, any of the, like the Deutsch four-way connector, we do not, and we've talked to Deutsch, they do not recommend it. Um, one, again, is it can uh, create a hydraulic effect. Um, if you put it in there, try to push it out, it will trap air and try to push itself out. Uh, plus it is an insulator. Um, dielectric grease is really a, a heat transfer compound um really is not a uh conductive material at all so it can cause you more problems than fix that if if the the crimps are right and the connection is right you shouldn't need it um the one we've seen where people have really caused some headaches for uh for us for the the tech department is that 12 pin module uh using the select modules um, we've seen people put big blobs of grease in that um, and has caused numerous headaches so yeah, please do not put grease in that one. Um, but anywhere you have connections, you know, talk to your, uh, uh, you know, depend upon whose connection it is, if it's an amp, if it's a Delphi, if it's a JAE, if it's a, a Deutsch, whatever, that, you know, different people have different specs for those, but pretty much everything we use, um, we do not recommend it on the connectors at all. Um, is there a part number for the four pin harness? Um, yes, there is that one. I actually know off the top of my head. Um, that is an H-00276. Um, I'll follow up with you, sir. Uh, I am very familiar with your company and everything. Um, so I will follow up with that and make sure you have that in price and everything. Um, uh, one thing is someone asked about the follow-up for this. Um, if you registered under your email, uh, tomorrow at 
about one o'clock in the afternoon, you will get an automatic response where you will get a link to this so you can listen to us again. Um, you probably much rather listen to Columbus and Paul and myself because you're probably tired of me, but um, you can watch this over and over. Um, feel free to share it. Um, in the resource guide, there is the links for the multimeter one. Um, so you can, again, go through that at any time and also that test. And we also have the, another thing on that, we also do have a, a bunch of uh, informational videos on, on YouTube as well. So please feel free to use those at your leisure and your convenience. Uh, they cover a lot of lot of basics and, and a lot of stuff that, that you may know but not, might need to be brushed up on. So, you know, never if you find yourself with some downtime, give it a look. And one thing is I forgot to mention is please don't go away yet. Um, we do have some survey questions at the end that we'd love for you to answer. Um, one of the things that we try to do is uh, keep making these videos. We want to support our customers, our friends out there. So um, those surveys are very important because we had a question too uh, from somebody about if we are going to do a solar panel uh, service in the future. Um, by you saying that, yes, we will. Um, solar is getting to be very big out in the fleet, um, especially the person that submitted that one. I know they have uh, lots of solar in their fleet. Um, it has been out in the fleet for a while, so it's now beginning to be something that we need to make sure that we are spending some time with techs, make sure they understand how the system works, uh, how to troubleshoot it, how to inspect it. So yes, we will be doing one of those in the very near future. Um, Paul, y'all take that one? What is the main function of the 12-pin module? The main function is, it is the main function. <laughs> it is what we call the brains of the system. There is a circuit board inside the select, yes, but that 12-pin module has the programming and the calibrations re needed and required to make that system work properly. So once you push it in, you'll see some lights in the back reflect on the back because there's LEDs on it and they'll blink and flash. And what they're doing is it's going through the entire system, looking at everything and checking all the connections and everything out to make sure everything's proper to where it can function. Um, someone asked about a spray anti-corrosion or an anti-corrosion spray. Um, again, once any connection is made, um, yes, feel free to do that. Whether it's, you know, again, batteries or uh, uh, some of the weather pack type stuff. Once it's mated, you know, all you're trying to do is keep any outside spray and then uh, keep it as, as impregnable as possible to the elements. Um, again, the only thing I ever get concerned about is uh, putting anything inside electrical uh, connections or terminals, you know, before you mate them. I want to, can I add something, Larry, on, in our controllers, you don't want to spray anything on where the wires are uh, screw down onto the posts because those posts and the nuts are stainless steel so there wouldn't be any corrosion on those yeah um and one of the things that never fails we go out and look at a lot of new trailers and it's always very uh from one extreme to the other yes you open up one nose box and there's none in it whatsoever yeah. you open up the other one i swear you can grease 15 cars with it um and the other thing too is if you are going to bother to apply it Use a brush or something to kind of smooth it and cover it. Yes. A big blob of grease on the top doesn't do any good if 90% of the, you know, didn't get any grease on it at all. And it dropped down inside the cover. Yeah. yeah. And and a little bit goes a long way. <laughs> I will say that. Yeah, nothing like, you know, doing service work, whatever, and takes 15 shop towels when you're done with, a, you know, one trailer. Um, Someone else about the orange insert on the four pin connector. Those parts are all available. You know, you can buy the the harness as a complete assembly, which is the easiest thing. But if you just lost the uh, secondary lock or whatever, yes, all that stuff's available. Just reach out. We can get you part numbers and prices for it. Um, had one. I'm not sure if we can answer it. Um, what if lift gate lowers but doesn't go back up? Question mark. Low battery uh, power? Question mark. It can be many different things. Um, and I've talked to the lift gate guys a lot of times. It's up is actually easier on the batteries within reason um, because to lower, you have to have enough battery voltage to trip the valves at the top of the, the columns 
um, or maybe ones in the, uh, the tuck under. That low voltage will prevent those solenoids from being able to operate. The pump will still work fine, but it can't open those valves to let the hydraulic fl uh, fluid flow. So it could be low battery power. It could be just um, bad connections to some of those valves that, the, again, the, the motor can run, but it can't operate all the valves it needs. Because if you look at the, the, where the batteries are in a battery box, and you look at where some of those valves are, that's a lot of wire it has to go through. And again, if someone you know damaged that harness, did a poor repair, you may not get the, the, the right voltage to trigger some of those valves that you need to. So uh, I, I probably answered that question with more of a question than an answer, but um, that's one that is, is not an easy answer. Uh, see if we have any more here. We're actually a little bit over time, but um, someone asked if there's a, a picture of the tool. I'm assuming uh, from when that question came in, it was a tool for cleaning the pins on the uh, Deutsch connector. Um, I do not have one handy, but I will be more than happy to find one, and I will send it to you, sir. Um, uh, I was actually going to double check. All right, we're going to uh, wrap it up. Uh, let, please stay tuned and, and answer the last couple survey questions. And thank you all very much for attending. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.